for this notebook because of how involved it is. It needed a professional narrator. It needed somebody that could wear many different hats. And I think that's where you did an excellent job. I mean, you took the step to the next level. Like I literally felt at times that I was on a phone line in the 1960s when you would, when you would do that trick with the phones. Yeah, yeah, I I put a little I put a little uh, I put a little filter on always on one side of I, I whatever perspective it's written from if it if it's written from the characters the, the characters perspective that that particular scene is written from I leave their voice clean but whoever's on the phone I I put a filter on that makes them sound like a phone and there might be another scene further on in the book where it's the same two characters but the it's from the perspective of the person on the phone with a different conversation I'll put the filter on the other character yeah that's 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 how that trick is played out yeah hello chuck says with his appalachian american dialect chuck i've been trying to get through to you for the last hour bruce says frantically sorry man it's total chaos out here this is the first call to get through on this end all night. You need me to come get you? Chuck replies. Bruce thought about where Chuck could meet him. Yeah, I do. Meet me at the corner of Depot and Van Buren. I'll be coming out of the woods from the direction of the sorority house. Get as close as you can. I'll meet you there in 30 minutes. You got it, man. See you soon. Steve Farley, how are you? I'm doing good, Graham. How are you? Excellent. Now, where do we join you? Because of all of the authors I work with, I think you have the most interesting life. Oh, well, thank you. I'm in Fort Wainwright, Alaska. I'm stationed here in the Army. I actually started leave Friday, so I'm catching a flight at midnight tonight. I've got 24 hours worth of travel to get back to Florida. Okay, so, so the room you're in now is your dorm room or whatever it's called, barracks? Barracks room, yes. It's actually not that bad. I uh, yeah. I have my own bedroom. I share a bathroom and what they say is a kitchen, but it's two stove burners and a small refrigerator. <laughs> okay, yeah. But as far as food goes, you eat with the other guys, I, I guess, yeah? Yeah, I, I eat at the uh, what they call the defect. That's like our cafeteria. So yeah. we get three meals a day there. Okay, right. And can you tell us what you've been doing? So we finished our winter um, training cycle. So now all the snow is gone, thankfully. Um, so now we're beginning our summer training cycle. So we've got a test coming up to make sure that we are proficient in everything that we have, whether that's different weapon systems, uh, first aid, we call it a CLS. That's like battlefield medicine, knowing how to keep somebody alive long enough to get to a doctor. Uh, so there's there's a lot of stuff that we train for over the summer, and now that it's nice out and not negative 50, we do significant running outside. So this is when we can actually do the five mile runs, and we've got a ski hill on the base that we can use. But now it's a very good training tool to run up and down. Well, thank you so much for your service. It's nice to know you're there. Well, thank you for your support, Graham. And while we were doing the book, you actually did. A little bit of active service didn't you can you talk about that i can't go too much into okay. it but um we are on uh something called qrf so there are times where we get spun up to go different places so you know we just do what we're told up here can you tell us what you do in the army is that is is that classified no it's not classified i'm what they call an 11 bravo i'm just a infantryman so okay. Just in the army infantry. So you're right amongst it. If well, it kicks yeah, up, I mean, if it kicks off, you're much. right there. Pretty much. Yeah. You mentioned Florida. That's where you live. Is that where you grew up? Uh, that is. Uh, that's where um, I have my home. I have my dogs there. My mom's taking care of them for me. So you know, that's anytime I get leave, I want to go back there, and you know, it's where all my friends are and family. I'll bet the dogs give you a nice welcome when you get home, don't they? Well, I have a 200-pound English Mastiff, so he uh, he, he does enjoy uh, someone that can wrestle with him. <laughs> okay, so when you were a kid, what kind of stuff were you... Because Falling Beneath the Magnolia is a magnificent book. 
magnificent book. What kind of stuff were you reading as a kid? Where do all your influences come from as far as literature? Well, literature, um, I was always a very big fan of Wilbur Smith. I had the pleasure of actually meeting him in Miami. Uh, Well, I'm only 32, but it seems like very long ago now. But when you say (laughs) something like 10 years, you know, once you cross the threshold of the 30s, saying 10 years ago doesn't sound too much older than it actually is. Um, And he was always an adventure novelist. He he had such detailed historical novels that he would place his fictional characters into these situations where they somehow have the outcome of World War II in the palm of their hands. Um, You know, they really cover the Boer Wars in South Africa. So there's just, they're so immensely detailed that I, I just fell in love with that genre. And, you know, I, I of course, got involved with Harry Potter. I love, I love those books. Yeah. um, Of fire and ice, uh, you know, known as game of Thrones on TV. So I do have, I like character driven novels. I do like point of view driven novels where you can see the different, different happenings. And, you know, you can see how other characters feel about the main character. So, when I decided that I would write, you know, I wrote my first book in uh, my junior year of high school. So I was about 17, 18. And the book that I wrote, I mean, it was a terrible book, but um, it did give me the lessons of knowing how to finish a project. So I took a few years off of writing and then I got into short story writing and eventually I decided that I wanted to create an adventure novel. It was this um, novel called Hurley Island. And it was about a family of five with five children that live on this island that they purchase. And there's poachers that are poaching the game that's on the island. So the family decides, well, there's no one around here to help us. So we've got to do it ourselves. So they go to war against this family of poachers. And I decided when I would write that I would do something called No Holds Barred. I wouldn't hold anything back. I would throw the stickiest, the darkest, most twisted shit I could think of into the novel. <laughs> and you know that, and that seems to be kind of like the, the style of writing I have that gives my novels such detail. Because at the heart of it, I'm not using anything that's old to humanity. In fact, I'm just tailoring my stuff based on historical events that have happened just and using that as influence in my writing. Yeah, so and I that comes it. across in in Falling Beneath the Magnolia uh, because you've set it in quite an interesting time, particularly American history, the time that you've set it in. Why did you, why did you set it there? Well, th- that time in U.S. history was very different. It was kind of like, in a sense, the Wild West. In the 1960s, you had a music revolution going on. You had a racial revolution going on. You had individuals seeking liberties that they never thought they'd otherwise have. And in the South, there's like a culture clash going on between individuals who wanted things to stay the status quo. And unfortunately, we've learned that time is linear. No matter what, it's time is going to progress and either you get along with it or you get swept away with it. So yeah. that having that time period, um, and especially the setting at the time. I mean, I love old-fashioned cars. I love uh, I love rock music. In fact, many of the chapter names are the titles of various songs or artists that I do like enjoy listening to. So when I was writing this novel, I just had classic rock playing in the background. You know, it was. It, it was something else. I mean, this this book took many years to put together. Um, I had to, most of the setting takes place in New Orleans. Yeah. And New Orleans was, I had to basically travel back in time through what research I could find to basically build a 1960s version of New Orleans. I've spent time there in the modern days, but it was significantly different on the French Quarter then. So I had to piece together all these different cultural groups. And of course, I threw some supernatural stuff yeah. into it. Yeah. But I didn't want it to be, I don't know, childish magic. I mean, you have to agree. It's pretty Oh, it's dark. pretty dark. It's pretty dark. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I think so, I, I think what what's nice is the book is almost in two halves because it starts out in Mississippi, and you've got Bruce, who let's let, let's face, let's be honest, he's a likable rogue, isn't he? Really, he is, and you just see his corruption just go, you know, periodically happening throughout the novel. He constantly is questioning himself whether or not, hey, is this me? Is this who I want to be? And in the end, he just says, fuck it, this is who I am. Yeah. And I mean, there's only one person in the world he wouldn't hurt, and in the end, he does hurt her. Like, yes, I mean, yes he does try to save her. I, I, want, I want to make it clear, though, he's not hes not a bad person. He, deep down, he's got quite clear values that he sticks to throughout the novel. I mean, he's challenged a lot, but... He, he seems to weave his way through it with integrity. As integrity filled as he can be, he does. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, he's he goes through a lot of challenges. He At first, you know, he seems like his life is on top of the world. Like he has the ability to move mountains. Anything he thinks he can do, he can. But he begins to learn that regardless of what actions he has, they have consequences to them. Hmm. So... He decides to rob a bank. You and I both know that there were consequences for that for him. It may not have been yeah. jail or imprisonment, but, and then when he gets those consequences, he decides that he's going to create a different result. He gets even. Yeah. And I think he has that kind of spirit that a lot of us wish we could have, where we are wronged, we're going to justify it in whatever way seems fit to us. Is there any of Bruce in you? I mean, I think we have a similar haircut, but other than that, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm a pretty passive guy. I don't, uh, you know, I don't, I don't seek conflict if I can avoid it. But a lot of times when I have these characters that I write, I try to part, put a part of personality. He's based on several people that I've met in my life. And so he combined to be this kind of perfect storm because I, I always get tired of reading stories where you get this perfect hero who can't do any wrong. He's not a hero. He, no, he's, he's flawed. He's more, yeah. more, he's more or less an anti-villain. And what, what I do like about him is the fact that he does have faults. He's yes. not perfect. He's handsome, but he's not by any means the most perfect person to walk the earth. And that's just like many of us are. We're all imperfect creatures. And it makes him more interesting for that, too. And if you think about the people who are fun to hang out with, uh, they're usually far from perfect. <laughs> and so it does make him someone who you wish you could meet, but in a safe environment and not get on the wrong side of, uh, because the consequences might be horrific. Yeah. You, you, you wrote some amazing characters, particularly when the book gets to... I mean, and I must say, you deal with what was going on in the time in, in Mississippi. Like, you deal with the racism head on. You really... Uh, I do. Go um, for it. Well, when I went to school at Ole Miss, that was my alma mater, um, I never... When I was there, I always... It was always there. The race was always prevalent. There were even issues going on when I went to school there. Uh, whether it was ignorance of the student body at times or kind of clinging to these southern roots to a degree. Um, and when I was there, I was also there for the university transforming it. There were songs that they removed from being played. And during football games, they banned Confederate flags from being waved during the stadium. They changed names of streets. I mean, when I first went to school there, they still had Confederate Drive. Uh, on the, uh, but that that was eventually you know they, they changed it around, um, and they did it in a way where they kept the history prevalent without carrying the baggage. Mm -hmm. mm. So they, I, I mean, when when I went to school there, I mean it's a beautiful place. Oxford, Mississippi is absolutely a gorgeous place, and now when you see a student body there, it's immersive, it's inclusive. Um, but there were always stories of what when what happened during the 1962 riot there, and it was brutal. It was more or less that night was a war on that campus. The U.S. Marshals released a statement many years later that said if that scenario was run again, 
there's no there's no way that that wouldn't have resulted in deaths uh, in the you know in the dozens, where the two deaths that were recorded there were actually the people that had died, and I kind of just took a Wilbur Smith uh, inspiration there and stuck Bruce right in the center of history, and. Um, uh, when, when I decided that and I knew I was writing a book in the South, I knew I had to approach this in the most respectful and gentle way I could without removing the scariness of what it was like to be there back then. Yeah, yeah. You so, don't want to ro over romanticize that. You've got to be gritty with that because so, it was so serious and so pivotal. Yeah, It was. It um, my mom used to tell me stories about how there were cases where she had friends that had to drink from different water fountains. Um, so you, if you can't imagine something like that now. I mean, we, we do have a country that is going through their own kind of, I guess, reformation phase at this moment. Um, but compared to what we have now to then, I mean, now we live in a utopia compared to what the issues that we dealt with in the past. But it's important to remember how this country overcame those. Yeah, yeah. The way you've written the book, the, the, the first section in Mississippi, the cops don't cover themselves in glory, do they? No, um, they, they pretty much did nothing during that night. Um, and, and that's historically true, is it? It is. Um, wow. There, there was a moment where the governor pulled all the state troopers. There was the town police, which was a handful of officers. They couldn't contain a, a riot of 4,000 people. So President John Kennedy had sent 500 U.S. Marshals. And you might think 500 well-armed men would be a good thing. But against 4,000 equally armed individuals, it kind of basically, I mean, these marshals were doing whatever they could to survive that night. And while, and they still succeeded in keeping James Meredith alive. Yeah. And they kept him safe and they pretty much kept the campus from burning down. If it wasn't for their actions that night, then there probably would have been several hundred people injured or, well, there were hundreds of people injured, but several hundred people would have died. Mm. And we could have been catapulted into a situation where, you know, God knows what could have happened. We could have had states succeeding. You know, there's always been talk that that could have caused statewide balkanization where mm. it was a domino effect. And... You know, you don't really hear too much outside of John F. Kennedy other than the Cuban Missile Crisis and a few things here and there, but he did play a pivotal role in integration. Mm. Yeah. I mean, he put the groundwork down that uh, th that eventually um, President Johnson, when he signed the uh, the 1964 uh, in the lyrics to the song, they, they signed a law in 64 that gave the, those without a little more. I think that's it, isn't it, from... Bruce Horns being the range, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. It was, well, it, but is it, it was Lyndon Johnson that did it, but it was Kennedy that started it all off. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, you know. In history, we always have to build off other accomplishments from other men in order to get to a shared goal, shared idealism, or shared, you know, mission. I mean, at the end of it, we're all in it together, aren't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's only one planet, but uh, it's just very divided, unfortunately. So then the story moves to New Orleans. And I think for me, because I had to perform them, that's where the characters just went. It was like, it, it was the, the characters on steroids because, you know, you've got the, the Creole influence and you've got the, the, the voodoo type thing going on. And the characters there were so much fun. Where, they, where did they come from? They, um, well, I... In college, I did know a lot of individuals that were from Louisiana. I had one guy that I, that I was friends with. He had such a thick Creole accent. Every other, I don't know. Have you ever seen Waterboy? Yes. Uh, yeah. Adam Sandler, the guy yeah. who speaks Asian. He's like, rah, 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 rah. you hear like only every fifth word. That that's yeah. where I got it from. But when you actually hear like a very like defined Cajun accent. It's it's almost a romanticized language in itself. Yeah, and because it's got that pretty, French influence well. too. What's that? The character Mickey, you did him very very well. Like, oh, thank uh, you so much. Yeah. So, 
And they were kind of, they were they were fun. That that second half of the book in New Orleans was so much fun to. I mean, it was a terrific story, but so much fun to perform the characters. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, the first part is when, when Bruce is still in college, that was kind of him. He had to get to a moment where he could walk away from something like getting his college degree or getting you know, settling down, marrying, or just sticking with bank robberies, or just something small. And I needed something that would catapult him into a situation where he kind of puts himself in a situation and he ends up around some of the most dangerous individuals in the city. And he's all, and he's able to not just become their equal, but also their leader in certain respects. Yeah. And that, like, creating those characters was it was wonderful. I mean, you know, I had to take influences from different things that I, I one experienced in my life to research, and I had to create characters that were authentic to that city while, you know, making them unique and individual. Because when, when you've got a gang of 70 people, you know, the ones that stick out, they have to be unique. They have to be their own people. Mm. You know, each one of them could have their own stories if, if they really wanted to. Yeah, exactly. And the good thing about the way the way you'd written the book, when Bruce is in Mississippi, he's kind of got a handle on the um, on on the campus life and how to find a place towards as as far as success goes to find a place towards the the, the top of that success. Like he's he's working the system. He's playing some cons and he does a really big one. He pulls a really big one. And he's got some things going on. But he's he's like he's his own man and his own boss in a long you know he doesn't, he doesn't answer to a lot of people. When he gets down to New Orleans and there's a system already in place there, a very violent system, but a very complicated hierarchy. And he starts at the bottom, but he quickly works his way up to the same kind of status as he was in New Orleans, which I thought was really clever because it shows you that this isn't a fluke that the, what this guy got to the position he was in in New Orleans. He was a big fish in a small pond. Down there, he's a small fish in a big pond, but he soon works his way up that food chain. It was very, well, very clever. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he gets bigger. Um he has to do it. It's either sink or swim, fight or, yeah. fight or flight. Yeah. Um, so when he's put into those situations, he only has his guts to rely on. You know, he has to pull himself up from his bootstraps. Or, and if he doesn't, he makes one mistake, he's going to be dumped into a barrel of acid. Like, they, they make yeah. it abundantly clear. You <laughs> take the next step or you get added to the body count. Yeah. And most people would run away. They would... You know, they'd flip, they turn, or, you know, they they would do it, but they wouldn't, you know, approach it. He's, he's an all-in kind of guy. If he does something, he's going to go all-in. But I mean, even when he's committing, you know, heinous acts and murders, and he still has a weakened stomach. I mean, there's moments where, you know, his humanity tries to show, and he tries to beat it back down with a stick. Yeah. But but he is, although he, he, he you know, as for, for the career he's in... He has to hide it. He is a sensitive soul. I mean, he was emotionally scarred by, I don't want to give too much away about the book, but romantically he was emotionally scarred in Mississippi before he got to New Orleans. So you show a sensitive side of him as well, which was very smart, I thought. It makes, it makes him more human. You could have made him like, you know, really cold, but he's cold when he had to be, but deep down he really did feel things quite deeply. Well, I... But that's how I think most people are, though. Um, most of us, even though we try not to show sensitivity, we are sensitive. You know, we're, we're fallible by our emotions, and it does. And I don't think it doesn't matter how hard or how cruel you are. When you're alone in your room by yourself, at the end of the day, those emotions that you have are going to show truth. Um, so, his emotions and his sensitivity is pivotal to his strength as a character as well. Yeah. I, I found in life that the people with the hardest shell, now whether that means they're a tough guy or 
or they're the class clown or comedian, the ones that are the, the more overt at that, they're the most sensitive people and they've built the shell to protect themselves from being hurt, usually. And I felt like that a bit that way with Bruce. Do you think if, if Bruce's life had been different at the beginning, he could have gone in a different direction? Or was he always destined for a life just outside the law or sometimes a long way outside the law? Do you think he, he could have? Because he could have made a great businessman if he'd put his mind to it, I think. The way you, the way you wrote him, do you think that's true? I, I, well, there were, believe it or not, the final draft that we have now wasn't always the case of the story. Right. So uh, in the first section of the book, when I first did it, that was originally, he was an 80 year old man looking back on his time. Right. And so like, and that just didn't fit. He didn't describe him as a guy that was gonna, th this is not the kind of ordeal you're gonna live through. Um, so, and then there was another path where he ends up with her, but I don't like two happy stories because <laughs> I, I don't feel that that's how life plays out. Like, yeah, it's a little bit Hollywood, plans. isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. You know, there's an old saying, you know, you tell God your plans and he's going to laugh. Um, so so in a sense, like, I don't want it to be predictable, but I also want to keep myself guessing when I'm writing. In the end, I don't really know what's going to happen until like I have the completed picture. I'm like, oh, all right, well. This is what I'm going to fit back into here and back into here. Because that's part of the fun I have in writing is not knowing truly how it's going to end up. I mean, you see the whiteboard behind me. When I plan a book, I literally do nap one, two, three, and four, and that's it. And I and they're one words. And wow. there's like a brief description of what the book's going to be. And then I just write. Wow. So, And how do you like, balance military life and writing then? Because... You know, you're working long hours and you're getting back there to the barracks and you're going to be pretty burnt out, I would imagine, the kind of things you've been doing physically and mentally. How, how well, do you then, then turn that to the ultimate cerebral, cerebral uh, discipline, which is writing a novel? Well, uh, it does have its challenges, but what the Army has given me, it's given me access to meet interesting individuals from all across the, the nation. So I've met multiple different personalities and I've learned one thing about the military. Everyone has their own reason for joining. And so having that has given me influence. So it's all, writing is 90% being inspired to actually sit down and write. That's, right. that's, that's the battle. The other battle is actually finishing the project. Um, right. So, I have both of those down. I've finished two projects since I've been here. It takes a little more time because my time is consumed. Yeah. But we, I, it, we are lucky that when we don't have anything going on for that day, we are let loose early. So I do have times when I am working where I can just go to the gym, get my stuff done, and then I come home and I just sit down and I write. And then I always try to go to bed really early. So, right. you know, I'm well rested. So the time that I do have, I'm not forcing it. A lot of times when writers are, they come out with a crappy book, they're forcing that writing in order to meet their, you know, their agents or their publishers deadlines. I, I'm a self published author. I, I yeah. operate on my timeline. Yeah. So um, I, I fit it here and there. And, and there's weeks like this where I'm on leave and I get, you know, two weeks where I sit down. I've been writing nonstop since I left work on Friday. So right now I'm trying to finish two projects. And the, the latest one is proving to be quite a challenge. Have you ever heard of Flat Earth? Yes. Yeah. There's people that actually believe the Earth is still flat. They actually believe it. And I don't know how because, you know, when I was 18, I first flew to New Zealand and I flew one way around the world and came home the other way. And if we had a flat earth, I'm not sure how that could have happened. And people must travel <laughs> how they can st they can think there's a flat earth. I don't know. Well, this involves a character that like he finally tries to piece the science together himself and it doesn't add up because, of course, it can't because it's a lunacy idea. <laughs> yeah. And so he, he somehow he gets two wishes. 
and they're going to come true. So one wish is that he believes all the things he believes are actually true. So everyone can see exactly what it is. Well, that comes true and destroys the fucking planet. <laughs> <laughs> What's this book going to be called? Flat Earth. <laughs> it's called Flat Earth. Flat Earth. Flat Earth, why it doesn't work. And you're working on that one now. I am. Yeah, that, that's, that's proven to be kind of funny. It's a funny project. So um, uh, I'm definitely I'm enjoying the way that one turns out. So, um, you know, I feel like that would make a good movie script at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you, I mean, inspiration comes at the most, you know, inopportune times. If you're busy working in the military, do you find yourself, I mean, I've got this vision, are you in like a foxhole writing notes? You know, is there? No. You know, no, no. <laughs> um, well, everything we do in the Army is extremely organized. Um, right. But there's a lot of times where we're waiting to begin something. Um, so, therefore, we're just sitting there waiting. Um, but, you know, we're not, I mean, we, we sometimes have to dig holes, but I think okay. The, the army is a very, uh, what's the best way to phrase it? It's very organized in the sense that everything we do has a purpose and yeah. a goal. Um, yeah. Everything is mission specific. So we're training for what may come. So right. we're, we're constantly learning battle positions or, you know, we're doing things like urban operations where we're learning how to go from building to building to clear rooms. Uh, we need to be proficient on many different types of weapon systems from heavy 50 caliber machine guns to the M4 rifle that we're using. So a lot of that time is spent being proficient in what we do. We have right. to know how to apply first aid in a way that allows a person to live. Yeah. Um, you know, you see many cases where this stuff comes in handy in the civilian world. You know, somebody gets a car accident and the first responder happens to be a bystander that is former military and yes they're able to stop bleeding and you know apply a tourniquet you know mm -hmm. you wouldn't believe the amount of prep that has to go into something like that yeah um, and then also we spent a considerable amount of time focused on personal fitness yeah. so whether it's you know lifting weights doing morning pt where you know now i say we're doing the five mile runs we have to do those runs with our body armor on so, so you have body armor and, you know, a soldier's kit, more or less, you can have somewhere from 50 to 80 pounds extra just on your body. And that's not including your rucksack that has everything you need to live on. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then in the Arctic, you have the other challenge of surviving in the winter. Um, that's usually when we do a majority of our training cycle. So this is in the summertime, it's more getting stronger for the winter you know yeah. like yeah. bears we're fattening up for the winter <laughs> but instead of fat we're putting on muscle and so when we go to these winters i mean there there was time in my last training cycle in the winter i'm a florida guy um so i mean majority of my wardrobe are flip-flops slip-on shoes and shorts well that wardrobe doesn't survive here so like i had to experience negative 50 degree weather which i've never experienced before and i had to be able to walk two to five ten miles a day in it and set up a tent and live off of it and you have a stove inside the tent but it only gets it to the negative degree you know it only gets it like minus two minus three but it feels like heaven compared to what's outside <laughs> yeah. and you have to be able to prepare yourself for that um yeah because there, there's a, uh, a mental you know barrier you have to cross so having those experiences has you know there's times where you're you're cold you're miserable so the only thing i want to think about if i'm not because when i'm focused on the job i'm only focused on the job um, yeah there was a book i read a while back called um what, what was it it was it was i think it was called like we were soldiers once Essentially, it was about a group of soldiers who were um, tra or, uh, who were moving through the brush in Vietnam, but they were imagining that they were part of like an action movie, like, and they found that that took away focus from the job at hand, which 
I've always been conscious of that. So I don't pretend like I'm anyone other than Steve, Steve Farley going through the brush and I've got a job to do. Um, so, but when I do have those moments where I'm sitting in my tent and I'm freezing, um, I think about my books and it takes me right. in a world away from it. So it does add to an escape. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it is challenging to balance time, but yeah. the time is well spent because I mean, a lot of my novels have a lot of action in them. So now I've gotten firsthand experience on how that action plays out. Yeah, you describe a lot of the weapons, which are obviously of the period. But I'm guessing it seemed to be when I was reading that you'd, you'd written it doing the research and you knew how these weapons worked and what they were capable of. Um, I've always been a gun guy. I guess that's kind of a Yankee thing we do over here as Americans. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, us Yanks and our guns. <laughs> um, I was always raised in a hunting household. Um, so... You know, we've always took the responsibility of gun ownership very seriously. Um, but I do know what certain weapons can and will do uh, when yeah. used. Um, so writing about guns of that period, I mean, it, and as I said, it was a very fascinating time because you had modern weapons that were being used at, or considered modern, like the M16 was being used on the battlefield. But at home here, Gangs were still killing each other with guns from World War II. Right, right. So it was what yeah. they had on hand. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. To... Yeah, and the market probably after World War II was flooded with them. <laughs> so oh, the well, black I mean, market, obviously, oh. not. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I mean, or it could be the current market, too. I mean, every once oh, really? in a while, I'll go down to a gun show in Florida, and you'll see an old weapon. And it's an M1 Garand. It used to be a, it was a rifle that they used in uh, World War II on the U.S. side. And you'll see it's got the property of the U.S. Army stamp on it. But um, I actually had the opportunity to buy a weapon at auction. It was, it's called a Sharps Rifle. It was a, a, a gun from the Old West period. And wow. it, it was a very fascinating weapon. Most of them aren't worth very much because... They had a coffee grinder built up into the buttstock. Well, if you can find a coffee grinder inside the weapon that's never been used, they're worth a fortune. Wow. Um, so I went out and I, I found one just like this, and the guy had no idea what he was really selling it for. So I, I bought it for a song. But the weapon was pivotal in both the, uh, the for the expansion into the West. This was basically known as the rifle killed the entire old buffalo out west right uh, okay so it was a very uh it was a very useful weapon of the period but on it it does have property of the u.s army cavalry so yeah i think I mean, it added an uh, an extra dimension the the detailed descriptions of the weapons and, and how they how they were used because the gangsters or the gangs that were were, were using them in in new orleans um you could see that they were specialists in this kind of thing, and uh, but it was lovely the way you'd you'd mixed in the dark magic. I think a lot of people would have just played that section straight, but you brought that in as well, which really gave it an extra dimension. And yeah, I can see how you you, you took Wilbur Smith. I could see that in there, but uh, the fantasy stuff as well um, to to bring that to life is wonderful. Well, I have to give credit to George R. R. Martin about that because yeah. in his novels, magic isn't a, it's not a predominant factor, but it slowly creeps into the novel. And I like that because it gives it kind of this, because we're writing about pretty dark things in it, but yeah. at the same time, it allows the reader to say, okay, this is fake. This is fake. So, okay. so like, but at the same time, the magic feels real. It's creepy. It's dark. Yeah. It's twisted. It's un inhumane. Yeah. It's the things that they do, I mean, are just, I mean, the albino, the children's sacrifice, that's yeah. actually a real belief that people have in Africa. Really? In certain, in certain parts of Africa, they will kidnap albino children and they will, you know, dismember them all for things like good luck. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's a real thing. I came across an article as I was writing this novel, and it was, I was just like, I don't know how, I don't know how I'm going to put it in this, but this needs to be brought to light because this is some sick shit. <laughs> yeah, but it works so well. It fits so well into the into the overall story and the people that you're dealing with it is it is great how did you find the process of turning your work into an audiobook well um i've used a narrator in the past and i just wanted something for this novel because it was so special to me it was such an involved process i think it just needed that extra edge to it and uh when i came so and then I always listen to, as I say, Wilbur Smith's books, and I always thought to myself, man, I would love to one day to have Sean Barrett narrate a book. And I realized that it's almost impossible to book him. <laughs> right, yeah. And to pay him, I would guess, as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He would probably <laughs> be looking for something in the six-figure range. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, uh, for this notebook, because of how involved it is, it needed a professional narrator. It needed somebody that could wear many different hats. And I think that's where you did an excellent job. I mean, you took the step to the next level. Like I literally felt at times that I was on a phone line in the 1960s when you would, when you would do that trick with the phones. Yeah, I, yeah. I, put a, I, put a little, uh, I put a little filter on, always on one side of, I. I Whatever perspective it's written from, if it if it's written from the characters, the, the characters' perspective that that particular scene is written from, I leave their voice clean, but whoever's on the phone, I I put a filter on that makes them sound like a phone. And there might be another scene further on in the book where it's the same two characters, but the, it's from the perspective of the person on the phone with a different conversation. I'll put the filter on the other character. Yeah, that's 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 how that trick is played out. Yeah. Did you find that the uh the point of views were uh, for the for this novel were easy to shift through. Yeah, I did actually. I mean, I have a I have a word file where when a character first appears, the first decent sentence because sometimes they might just say one word, but the first decent sentence I do as that character, and I'll usually when a new character appears, I'll have three or four different goes at it. I'll try an outrageous one, or, and then I'll settle on, no, that's the character there. Once I've finalized that voice, I take that first decent sentence that they've done, good-sized sentence, and I put it in a folder marked voices. I have a, for the book, when I'm, when I'm working on the book, I have a, um, a folder, and then within that folder, I have different files. And I have the raw WAV files in case it needs an edit. I have the produce files. I have a voices file, and in the voices file is where I put alphabetically all the different characters because I found, you know, in some books, a character might disappear for about 10 chapters and then they show up again and I've got to get them exactly how I had them back then. You know what I mean? So I can, I've got my reference point I can go to. So switching between them, uh, it's a little bit more time consuming that way because I have this database of them switching between the characters. I don't find hard at all because the main characters, I kind of know them and I just do them. But when there's some of the minor ones cro crop up and they haven't been around for a little while, I have a quick listen to how I did them. And, and then, well, uh, you and did a very good out. job with Chuck. And Chuck is actually based off my college buddy, Michael. Is and he? Yes. Yeah. So you do his accent perfectly. Oh, it's great. Like listening to him. <laughs> and I also, believe it or not, even though it's a female voice, I think you do a very good Tally B. Oh, right. Yeah. Because I didn't want to make her sound overly Southern, but she had to be a Southern belle, but not not that caricature one you get in certain movies. Um, you know, I know, I know uh, Disney well, for a while there. she comes from an educated family. That, so yes. She, yeah. Because so the clues to the characters sound. are always in the, in the book and they're there because you write the characters so three-dimensionally. And I'll read a lot, quite a lot of the character before I'll start even going on the voice. But yeah, and I'll go back and change them. There were times, I'm trying to think of an example, but it ha happened in this book where I was a few chapters in and a character wasn't right. And I went back to previous chapters and redid all their dialogue. I think because as we went back and forward and you were checking it, I think there was even one time when you... You said something, and I said, oh, don't worry, I fixed that. I went back and changed them. Was it a mispronunciation? 
I can't remember. It was, but it was Carlos Marcello. That's right. I was calling him Marcello for about four chapters. I think and... that's it too. But it does. But Marcello is the Italian pronunciation. Is the Italian. And once I'd worked that out, then I went back and changed every single reference to him. Yeah. I don't. I don't leave a, I don't, although I do the, the book in chunks, I do it in two hour chunks and you approve them and then I move on. Although I do that, I don't leave it there. If something later on comes up that makes something else need to change, I'll go back and change the ones that have already been approved. Um, because you've got to have that consistency. It's got to, you can't just suddenly change a character's accent or a character's name. You've got to back, but it was, it was Marcello. But he sounded better as Marcello anyway. It just it, it and it's got a Marcello. It's got that hard ch in there that that really kind of, you know, when he's Marcello, it's just soft. I don't know what that all means, sound but it, it doesn't sound sinister. You're right. You're right. I it, mean, he just keep needed in mind, that. This was an individual that some conspiracy theories there have said that he orchestrated the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Like, right, because there's he, a New Orleans connection, connection, isn't there? Because Oswald was down there. Yeah, he was down there. Um, there. There's a lot of subtle references in this book towards it, uh, just because, I mean, the evidence is just down there is so overwhelming that something was planned in New Orleans that correlated John F. Kennedy dying. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, when I when I when I came across Marcelo, and the thing is, he never makes an appearance. But he's that dark cloud in the background, and that's how he operated that city. Yeah. So he's real. Carlos Marcello, yeah. He is. A wow. He, wow. He died, I think, in, sometime in the 90s. Wow. I'll tell he you something else that, that comes through in the book, and I don't know how you did this. I've been to Mississippi, and I've been to Louisiana. I've been to New Orleans. In fact, I rented a car, and... For about a week and a half, we drove from Memphis to New Orleans, and we didn't book any hotels on the way. We just stopped wherever we liked. We met the most wonderful people along the way in some of the poorest parts of the, the Union, but we met some really terrific, friendly people. Is that that overwhelming, the heat can be, and the, and the humidity and how oppressive it is and how it kind of, it's almost like molasses. It makes, it's just, you managed to capture that, particularly in the New Orleans. Do you know, even know how you did that? Um, well, I spent a lot of time in the South growing up down here. Yeah. And uh, my time in Mississippi, uh, I, there were times where I'd stayed a summer there. And it was, well, there was one summer where the heat, where the air conditioner went out in, in the place I was renting. And it was brutal. Like Alaska up here, we don't have air conditioners, but uh, I, I made a promise to myself up here. I will never complain about heat when I have it. <laughs> so I just deal with it. I'll just jump in the cold shower before I go to bed and then, you know, sleep with uh, ice, uh, you know, frozen peas or something. But here, but like that, that summer was unbearable. And when I was writing, and then I've been in New Orleans when it's been absolutely muggy before. I spent yeah. a lot of time in New Orleans when I was researching this novel. And, and that was one thing, air conditioners were not a thing on the French Quarter then. Yeah. And I just imagined myself back in that dingy apartment, like flies swirling around pizza. Like, I mean, it, it's like it's like being in a constant hot fart. Like you can't escape, <laughs> like the stench. You do, eventually, you just get used to it, and yeah. and when you actually breathe fresh air, I remember when I left New Orleans and I went back to Florida. Uh, my mom and I went to the beach the next day, and I was like, "Here's fresh air." But Florida gets warm in the summer too. I mean, I was um, I've been to Florida and I've been to um, New Orleans and Mississippi, and <laughs> funnily enough, I've been in both states in um in august but there's something about the mississippi and the southern the louisiana heat that just seems to slow everything down it's it does just, I mean, yeah you can well, see why I mean, the blues is 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 so some some blues music 
from down there. Delta Blues is, is by and large, quite slow because <laughs> you just don't have the energy. Yeah. It's slow, but I mean, when you are, but like when you're there, it does set the atmosphere because already you've got the heat. Yeah. And then sometimes you might notice that the jazz tone speeds up the colder it gets. <laughs> oh, really? Really? Wow. Or maybe that's just my mind playing tricks. Well, on. no, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it's a fabulous book. It's calling. It's called Falling Beneath the Magnolia. It's by Steve Farley, and it is quite wonderful. It's a journey, not only a, a journey through the South of America, but a journey through time as well, and a journey through magic and something very, very dark. It's not for the faint-hearted. It's, uh, but it's. It's, it's really, really, really well written and really, really good with some fabulous characters, which was great for me to, to have fun with. I've put links in the description. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link there to Amazon, which will hook you up with the audio book. And if you go in a bit deeper, you can find the uh, the ebook and physical book and everything as well. And so what's next for Steve Farley? That is the, is the Flat Earth the next thing you're working on? Well, um, actually, uh, while I've got you live, um, I can ask... I am preparing to put my novel Ant's Tale to audiobook. And so oh. she did such a fantastic job with this one. That is a five, so far now, a five book series. And multiple points of view, lots of action, and well, of course, sex. You can't, you can't miss all that. But that yeah. is uh, my next project is getting that series into the, into the ears of. Um, other people out there so well obviously steve i i'd love to be involved in that when the time comes um just uh just great because it was great working with you it really was great working with you 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 even changed countries at one stage and you changed back you you sent me a photo of your uh your meal one day um in the military and it was just uh it was great working with you and 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 this one is a fabulous book and i hope we can do many many more in the future steve farley thank you so much you've got a plane to catch at midnight you're gonna go back home you're gonna be reunited with your dogs i hope it all goes well for you mate but uh, if you're watching this get get it downloaded as an i mean you read if you if you prefer reading a book read a book too it's it's marvelous to read i've i've read it i know but uh if, if you like the audio book version check it out falling beneath the magnolia by steve farley thanks graham cheers